Um, I'm going to get started. There's enough people in here, and I actually have a decent amount of slides to get through. So I'm John Teethy. I'm one of the 50-year residents in the FR stream, um, for those who do not know me. Um, and I guess it's my final grand round. So I'm doing it on sort of two medications that we kind of come across not infrequently, um, and sort of a lot of their toxicologic principles. Um, I guess from a formality perspective, uh, unlike the two at the bottom, I have no biases or disclosures or disclosures of commercial support. Um, my general approach to my grand rounds over the past few years has been to, been to kind of highlight sort of new age medications that have come out and a lot of their toxicologic um, principles that they may have. And a lot of these things are medications that we see frequently um, and they may be sort of poorly described, um, if at all, um, in our current uh, textbooks that we do have. So a lot of this is based around a case that I saw about a year and a bit ago. Um, I mean, nothing kind of crazy, but just kind of got me interested in these two topics. So um, there's a 25 year old guy who had a polysubstance overdose um, from EMS. They initially saw him and it sounded quite opioid. Um, he had decreased the level of consciousness, meiosis, respiratory rate was down. They gave him some Narcan, he responded to it. And then shortly thereafter, he started seizing. He had a normal blood sugar and was, was responsive to benzos. He had a pretty unremarkable course, got admitted to medicine, form one, all that kind of jazz. Um, and then on collateral history is that the patient was on venlafaxine and then was ram or sorry, recently started on tramadol. So as I said, this kind of, you know, made me kind of dig into the literature a little bit after I saw this case, because there's two medications I wasn't overly, um, you know, comfortable and saw on a uh, consistent basis and hence where these rounds were birthed from. So the first medication I'm going to talk about is venlafaxine. Um, and venlafaxine is something called an sort of a, a different type of um, antidepressants and it's something called an SNRI or selective or sort of serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Uh, Eric went over a lot of the sort of um, sort of um, neuropharmacology of serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake in his cocaine round last week and this kind of highlights the same things. Um, but from a sort of psychiatric perspective, serotonin is used more for mood and anxiety and norepinephrine is used more for sort of alertness, energy and concentration. The only available form of, of an SNRI, well, there's actually two forms, but the major one that we see is something called venlafaxine or Effexor. There's actually, it actually gets metabolized in something called des venlafaxine, and that's the medication called Pristique that people are on as well. Uh, there is an immediate release version um, worldwide, but Canada, we only have the extended release. Um, there's, you can see the dose ranges there, and it can actually go up to 225 milligrams daily. Um, it's actually in the States, it's the sixth most commonly prescribed antidepressant after SSRIs and bupropion. Uh, and in Canada, some of the literature that I've read says it's actually the fourth most commonly prescribed uh, antidepressant in the country. Um, its indications are for depression and anxiety. It was launched in the mid nineties and from its original clinical trials, they had 12 overdoses, no fatalities and one seizure. I kind of want to highlight this concept of something called the hazard index. And it's, I used this in my rounds last year as well, but the way you can kind of think of it is it's sort of the rate of life-threatening or lethal outcomes per 1,000 single ingestions of an agent. Um, and the index is usually inversely proportional to the frequency. Um, so what that kind of means is the more hazardous um, compounds that we see are, for the most part, um, implicated less frequently. And as you can see, it sort of has the same profile as, at least in this study, of sort of like citalopram and lithium. Um, However, it may actually be a little bit more toxic than that. So this is another study out of the UK that looked at sort of the mortality index of um, sort of common uh, antidepressants that they see. And it actually has a similar fatality toxicity to the low dose TCAs like clomipramine. Uh, but as you can notice, there's actually a very low uh, fatality in SSRIs. Um, and it seems like the most toxic S SRI is fluvoxamine, um, which I guess kind of makes sense. We see a lot of SSRI overdoses and for the most part, they're usually quite benign. So I think, you know, you should already prime in your mind that when someone comes in with venlafaxine, um, you should just have a, you know, uh, respect it a bit more and have a higher index to kind of treat them a little bit more aggressively. And what does it do from a tox perspective? I mean, most antidepressants, they exert their effects from sort of CNS excitation and seizures and um, from cardiovascular compromise. And as I sort of learned through reading Rosen's this year is, um, everything kind of ends in this final pathway of seizure, coma, and death, um, which we'll kind of get into as well. So how does it compare to some of the other compounds that we see? So this is a study that looked at sort of the relative toxicity of SNRIs to SSRIs and TCAs. 
Um, as you can see, overall, there's about a 13.7% rate of them having seizures. Um, and when you kind of break it down between the two um, compounds versus TCAs, venlafaxine will be more likely to cause seizures and serotonin syndrome. And versus SSRIs, more likely to cause seizure, serotonin syndrome, QRS prolongation, and IC admission. Uh, but as, as you can see as well, upwards of a third of these patients will actually have serotonin syndrome and require ICU admissions. When they kind of, the study kind of further went and compared SNRIs to TCAs, and you can see their odds ratio are substantially increased for things like seizure and serotonin syndrome. And this is for both adjusted and unadjusted um, odds ratios for things like age, co-ingestions, amount of drug, and time to presentation. You know, the one thing we always have to worry about is sort of a risk stratification we have to apply to all these patients. And a lot of it is sort of dependent on time of exposure and amount of medication um, taken. And the median dose for seizure is about a little bit over three grams, but the minimum dose is actually 900 milligrams. So if you're on the 225 milligrams daily, four tablets may be enough to make you have a seizure. Um, as kind of anything in the talks literature, there are case reports of seizures happening at therapeutic dosages as well. Um, so this is uh, a study out of sort of the California Poison Control Center. I'm looking at time to seizure onset. On the left hand of the table, there is the immediate release. We don't have to worry about it because patients aren't, that's not a, a compound available in Canada. And um, however, with the um, venlafaxine XR, which was what we come across, um, the time to first seizures usually seems to be pretty early um, at about 3.7 hours. Um, however, a quarter of these patients will have their first seizure after seven to 24 hours. And the longest reported time of a patient having a seizure is 24 hours, and that's really going to dictate um, the time for medical clearance. Moving on to the cardiovascular um, side of things, um, this is again another review of that. Um, kind of not surprising that it um, increases norepinephrine um, in the synaptic cleft. It kind of acts as you know norepinephrine will make you have tachycardia, hypertension, and uh, mydriasis. Um, the other thing we worry about, you know, with anything from a tox perspective is, or what are their intervals? 10% of patients will have QTC prolongation. It seems to be slightly higher in males um, for kind of unknown reasons. And about 3% of patients have QRS prolongation. Um, and this has been sort of well documented and well studied. This is a study looking at, you know, guinea pigs. And it's found to inhibit um, sodium um, channel, that's some blockade, but it seems to actually affect the resting channels, which is a bit different from the TCAs and the, you know, cocaines and lidocaines and other class one antiarrhythmics that we see. Um, what's actually interesting though, is that the steady state concentration, um, at, which correlates to sort of the normal dose in humans, about 25% of those sodium channels are already blocked. Um, so again, as I was kind of alluding to with, constant, you know, amount of uh, drug ingested. It's sort of, this table kind of highlights things that I've seen across the literature of like how we can kind of build it up. Um, it seems once you get to about three grams is when, you know, things start to get a little bit hairy where a third of the patients will seize. And as you get up, the seizure risk after four and a half grams is about a hundred percent. And once you get to around four and a half grams is when you get um, more of the cardiac uh, compromise as well. This is more of a, you know, purely out of interest in me getting into the weeds of the literature, but this is a topic of something called the heart rate variability. And the way you can think of it is it's sort of um, the measure between each RR interval or the measure of variation um, between each heartbeat. And this has been extensively um, researched in the cardiac uh, literature for sort of risk stratification and whatnot. Um, but in a way, it's sort of a standard non-invasive way of measuring the autonomic nervous system. On one end, people with a low heart rate variability, they view this as sort of a poor marker um, or of less favorable health. And these patients have essentially a fixed heart rate with no variability. Um, in the context um, from the cardiac literature, it's an independent risk factor for sudden cardiac death, mort mortality post MI, and for CHF mortality. But they've also found that at sort of the baseline, there is a low um, heart rate variability in um, patients with anxiety and depression. However, on the flip side, um, patients who have a high heart rate variability, they're able to mount a physiologic response and they have a general better underlying um, physiology and health. And you can kind of think of it as sort of like looking at the balance between your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Um, and this is actually integrated into a lot of like Fitbits and Apple Watches and a lot of those apps that kind of track your overall cardiac health. And it's actually kind of interesting for those who may want to look into it further. But They've actually looked at this in the context of venlafaxine. These patients were given paroxetine and venlafaxine, and they looked at their heart rate variabilities. What they found is that with um, patients on 
um, venlafaxine, they had a reduced vagal control and thus they had a low heart rate variability. So like most things, when we see it, you know, a lot of these patients will need medical clearance um, first. And, you know, for the most part, these patients rather go to, um, you know, be admitted to CTU or they'll go to ICU if they're more severe. Um, and the SMR will always inevitably ask us, did you call Ontario Poison Control? Um, so if you can go back to that slide about sort of amounts taken, it seems like three grams is kind of the cutoff of when we should start to worry. Um, there is one case report of QRS widening at three grams, but they were also on um, an antipsychotic as well. And it wasn't a pure overdose. Once you get more than that eight grams, it's sort of like they need to go to ICU, QRS widening, QTC prolongation, and they're inevitably going to seize. Um, as I said, the seizure median dose is about three grams and the minimum dose is 900. Um, but I would certainly suggest that anyone who's ingested more than 900 milligrams needs 24 hours of medical clearance. And for children, um, if it's under 5.5 milligrams per kilogram, um, it's considered safe. Um, a lot of the poison control centers that Morgan was um, kind of messaging me about says, if they're under five and a half milligrams per kilogram and they're asymptomatic, that's actually their cutoff to not be sent to hospital. Um, if they have symptoms or they ingested more than five and a half milligrams per kilogram, they need to come in and be assessed. As for treatment, I mean, nothing groundbreaking here, you know, sort of treat them in the usual fashion from a tox perspective. If they seize, they'll be responsive to benzos. If their QTC goes long, you give them mag. If their QRS prolongs, you give them bicarb. Um, and obviously if they collapse, you give them some fluids and pressors. Um, and it is not actually a, because of its uh, a volume of distri distribution, it's actually not amenable to hemodialysis. But one thing we can do um, that may have an effect is actually early and aggressive decontamination. So this is um, a couple studies I looked at into this, but um, this one in particular looked at giving patients single dose activated charcoal will increase the clearance of the medication by about a third. And then when you combine that with whole bowel, um, it will reduce your absorption by about 30% and cause a greater reduction in um, the uh, sort of concentrations versus single dose activated charcoal alone. So essentially just give them charcoal and give them whole bowel um, if you're worried. From the, you know, when you think of the sort of neuropharmacology of it, um, it kind of makes sense that people may actually abuse it. I mean, it seems like there's actually pretty good um, literature out there saying that um, primarily adolescents will get venlafaxine, about 10 to 15 tablets of it, and they'll crush it up and snort it. And it gives them sort of an MDMA and amphetamine-like high with um, also some sort of um, hallucinogenic or psychedelic properties. And this kind of makes sense with the norepinephrine and um, serotonin uh, reuptake inhibition. It will cause false positives on urine tox screens. Um, for PCP, as will uh, dextromethorphan or uh, the co compound that we commonly see in over the counter cough medications like Benalin and Robitussin and whatnot. Um, there also is this sort of thing described called a neonatal venlafaxine discontinuation syndrome. Um, this usually happens with an onset at birth to about day four, um, and they'll present with poor feeding, jitteriness, respiratory depression, and myoclonic seizures. It's a relatively new phenomenon, and they haven't found any long term consequences of it yet. Um, but it is something kind of just to be aware of as well. Um, but what I want to focus the majority of my talk on is tramadol. Um, you know, not so much to maybe, you know, I don't want to tell you people how to do your practice, but I think it's a medication that's quite complex and it's actually quite poorly understood. Um, and I kind of just want to highlight that maybe it's not as, not as a benign of a medication as we once think that it is. But let's kind of look into the history of this medication. So, it was patented and invented in 1963 by this pharmaceutical company called Grunenthal in West Germany. Um, from a historical standpoint, they were the first company to release and widespread penicillin after the Second World War. However, in the mid-60s, they also invented a medication that was widespread called thalidomide. Um, in the mid-70s, it was brought onto the market in uh, Germany, and then the mid-90s in the States, and then um, in um, 2005 was brought into uh, Canada. Um, a lot of people use it or talk about it as sort of this opioid light um, or a weak opioid. And I don't like it's kind of interesting, you know, from a pragmatic perspective. But I guess what that kind of means is, and it's supported in the literature, is that tramadol itself, the parent compound, binds the mu1 opioid receptor at about one six thousandth the affinity to morphine. So maybe that's why people consider it a weak opioid. Um, it's actually, it's active metabolite, this O-desmethyltramadol or ODT, um, that actually has majority of its, has most of its opioid activity and it binds the mu1 receptor with 700 times the affinity of tramadol, still at a reduced amount of 
um, uh, compared to morphine, but it still binds the opioid receptors. Um, I guess kind of the same way, you know, Bud Light will activate your GABA receptors um, compared to a stronger beer. But what's very interesting though is tramadol in itself is actually an SNRI, which a lot of people don't know. Um, it has shares a ton of very similar um, properties to venlafaxine. And it's only under this SIP inhibition that it gets, sorry, uh, SIP metabolism that it gets metabolized into an opioid or ODT. And in many ways, it kind of is a dirty drug. It's, you know, a parent compound is an SNRI with a little bit of opioid activity. It's also a serotonin receptor antagonist. It's anti-muscarinic, it's anti-nicotinic, and it's an NMDA antagonist. And it only gets metabolized into an opioid, um, but also it has a little bit of activity in itself. But it kind of highlights this, you know, sit metabolism variability, kind of in the same um, frame of mind as um, codeine and morphine. So on one end, you have patients who are absent metabolizers, where they have sort of down expression of their sip, um, enzymes, and what they're going to have is the inability to metabolize a medication. They're going to have more of the parent compound or more of the SNRI. This is found in about 6 to 10% of Caucasians, 2 to 5% of African Americans, and 1% of Asians, where they will not metabolize this medication at all. But what's a bit more worrisome is on the complete opposite side, um, these patients who are ultra metabolizers or high metabolizers, and they're going to get more metabolism and more of the opioid effect. And this is found in about three to six and a half percent of North American Caucasians, 30% of Ethiopians, 20% of Saudi Arabians, and 10% uh, of Greek and Portuguese. Again, you know, highlighted in the literature, um, these are patients that got tramadol, um, the IV compound. And they looked at the concentrations of um, ODT several hours after. And you can see there's a huge variability in the active metabolite concentrations. So in many ways, when you prescribe someone tramadol, you're kind of rolling the dice as to what medication they're going to get. On one end, they, you know, the prodrug is an SNRI, among others. There's some sketchy variable metabolism that we can't really predict. And you get an unpredictable mix of opioids and SNRIs. And in the literature, they say there's some upwards of a 17-fold difference in the amount of med uh, in the amount that gets metabolized. But why should we care about this? Um, so this is you know, um, a study that sort of Canada and the states have released together looking at opioid prescription rates. And what they found is that there's about a 3.3% decrease in opioid prescriptions per year between 2010 and 2017 in Canada. However, in that time, Tramadol prescriptions have gone up by 4.6%. Um, tramadol is the fourth most commonly prescribed opioid in Canada, uh, which was actually a shock um, when I kind of read through all this literature. Um, from a unit's perspective, and actually from a sales perspective, it's the third most commonly prescribed opioid in Canada. Um, it's actually not regulated as an opioid yet. Um, it seems like in the sort of new updates of the FDA, they're going to... Um, uh, changes classification, but it's currently regulated as the other addictive titans such as atorvastatin and lisinopril. Um, but as you can see, between 2012 and 2016, there's been a 24% increase in the uh, 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 dispense rate of tramadol. This is the sort of National Poison Data Center uh, review of um, kind of all medications that they come across in the states. Um, this is the 2018 report because the 2019 report has not come out as of yet. But at that point in time, of substances that they uh, most frequently encounter, analgesics and antidepressants are first and third, respectively. Um, when you're looking at TOSH-related fatalities, um, opioids are the third most common at 8%, and SNRIs actually account for 1.4% of all TOSH-related fatalities in the States. Um, there, this data is not available in Canada, um, but yeah, 1.4% in States. Um, SSRIs, no fatalities. But I guess we should also look at, you know, if it's so commonly being prescribed is whether or not it actually works. And sort of long story short, it doesn't. Um, there's no study I could find that shows tramadol superior to NSAIDs for sort of a variety of reasons. A single dose of tramadol of 100 milligrams is roughly equivalent to 400 milligrams of ibuprofen. Several meta-analysis have been done, and this one out of France in the early 2000s says that it's no, Tramiset, which is the compound of tramadol and Tylenol, um, was no more effective than NSAIDs, but it was superior to Tylenol. The most um, 
I guess a lot of these are done in post-surgical patients, these studies. Uh, however, the one that I could find that's the most applicable to emergency medicine is this Edwards one that's below this box. Um, and it was looking at sort of acute dental pain. And it found that the number needed to treat for 50% pain reduction was 2.3 for NSAIDs and 9.1 for tramadol. Um, another study looked at, it was actually an RCT that looked at um, you know, patients being given tramadol versus Tylenol and seeing if they had any um, A pain relief and um, um, differences in sort of diagnostic accuracy. And there's no difference in pain scores between the two and none of them masked any um, underlying surgical pathologies. Also, the Cochrane Review has looked into this extensively as well. And um, for osteoarthritis, there's no benefit for pain or function and it increased adverse events. Um, for, fibromy for fibromyalgia, there's insufficient evidence to support or refute it. So it's kind of neither here nor there. And uh, for neuropathic pain, there's very, very low quality evidence. Um, it's actually uh, quite interesting. I was reading the riveting chapter on peripheral neuropathies yesterday. And um, it's actually in here that they highlighted that the number needed to treat for pain relief and diabetic neuropathy is five for tramadol. So that may be actually the only thing I can find in the literature that has any support of its use. Um, this is on the background of, you know, as we kind of know that opioids are not um, superior to treatment versus non-opioid pain uh, for non-opioid medications for improving pain related function, um, kind of um, with respect to chronic back pain and osteoarthritis. Um, but what's always interesting, we always have to think of is whenever we start someone on it, really any medication, especially opioids, is whether or not they're going to be on it for a prolonged period of time. Um, and it seems like there actually is an association between short-term tramadol use and persistent opioid use. Um, and it seems like people receiving tramadol after surgery have somewhat of a higher risk of prolonged opioid use com compared to those actually relieving short-acting opioids. Um, this is actually kind of an interesting study. So this was, they randomly sampled, um, they, got, they looked at all the opioid prescription rates in the States um, between 2006 and 2015. And they randomly sampled 10 of them and then looked at whether or not they were on um, long-term opioids after that. So the probability of being on an opioid after one year after a short-acting course of opioids is about 5 to 9%. But with tramadol, it's actually 13.7%. Um, and factors being associated with increased long-term opioid use would be things like being on it for more than 5 or 31 days, having a second refill, more than 700 milligrams of a morphine equivalent cumulative dose, and having an initial 10 to 30 day supply. Um, also, interestingly, patients on tramadol have a one year increased all cause mortality versus you know, NSAIDs, diclofenac, um, salabrax, and whatnot. And there's no difference between codeine and tramadol. So maybe it is not of a benign medication as we once thought it was. It also interestingly causes. Um, predictable hypoglycemia in patients. And it seems to kind of relate with um, sort of aligns perfectly with the anticipated pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic effects of tramadol. And not surprisingly with that, um, it actually causes an um, increased odds of hospitalization for hypoglycemia with patients after being started. Um, th there's sort of an increased risk for hospitalization for hypoglycemia. And most of these actually are within the first 30 days. Some further studies out of France have said that actually three quarters of these occur within the first 10 days, and I guess not surprisingly, more frequently in the elderly. Um, there is a higher risk um, in diabetics versus non-diabetics, and in 50% of type 1 diabetics who get tramadol will become hypoglycemic after. There's also a two-fold increase in the risk of hospitalization for hyponatremia um, from sort of unknown mechanisms, and that would be compared to codeine. Um, it also increases the likelihood of both Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, and it seems to have some interference with dopamine synthesis and release. Um, but this is kind of poorly studied and not really well validated outside of a couple of case reports. Not surprisingly that it, you know, is an opioid, um, it will cause respiratory depression. And this can happen at both therapeutic and super therapeutic dosages. And this kind of brings back into this notion of the sort of poor and ultra metabolizers. Not surprisingly, it will respond to naloxone because it is an opioid. Um, and it seems to be a higher risk of this happening in patients with chronic kidney disease. Um, and with respect to pediatric patients, there is um, very good evidence of respiratory depression at therapeutic dosages. And it's actually, um, there's a black box warning out there that it's contraindicated in children under the age of 12, um, the same as codeine, probably from the same you know, underlying um, like metabolism variability.
And another thing with opioids, you always have to worry about is addiction. It acts on the same areas of the brain um, from fMRI evidence known to be related to addiction. And withdrawal of opioids, um, sorry, they'll get classic opioid withdrawal symptoms after abrupt cessation of tramadol. And there's sort of two ways we could think about it. On the left, you have your sort of typical or your cows, you know, the tachycardia, the sweating, the mydriasis, the pyloerection. Um, but one in eight patients will have an atypical withdrawal response. Um, and it's more sort of like neuropsychiatric hallucinations, paranoia, psychosis, anxiety. Um, it seems like the onset is about 12 to 20 hours after, and the duration is upwards of one to three days. And it's actually very good evidence that um, it's very well described in the literature that this can actually happen after short courses of tramadol um, uh, use. From a global perspective, it's actually a um, very commonly abused medication across the world. Um, mainly in sort of the Middle East and in Africa. Um, and as you can see, there's been a almost a 200% increase in the global consumption of tramadol um, in the sort of the first part of this millennia. Um, this is a report that I found out of CSIS. Um, it seems like there's a lot of you know, pharmaceutical companies in India that are making them and then just sort of shuffling it into the Middle East um, and um, Africa through ISIS and Boko Haram. From a global perspective, um, there's been a five-fold increase in tramadol-related deaths between 2004 and 2015 in the UK, and it was only up until 2014 when they actually regulated it as an opioid. Iran has a 33-fold increase in tramadol-related deaths throughout the same time, and in Cameroon, there's an 80% of all NVCs are involved with um, tramadol, and about 50% of the patients abuse it on a regular basis. So I guess not surprisingly, there is sort of clear signs of physical dependence, um, and they sort of describe a euphoria similar to heroin use. Um, as I kind of talked about a few slides earlier, that the militia group Boko Haram, um, you know, seems to like rampantly abuse tramadol. On one end, it makes you think, you know, maybe are they getting um, more of an effect because of, you know, variable sit metabolism, um, but also, it's also considered to be a mood enhancer and it can also um, increase sexual stamina or boost energy during work. Um, it's actually rampantly um, abused in Egypt as well. So it's the second most common substance of abuse after cannabis and hashish. Um, and it's the most common drug of abuse by bus drivers. Um, so, I mean, we're not going to be able to travel for an indefinite period of time, given what's going on in the world. But if you, when all this clears up and you go to Egypt and you take a bus, consider yourself warned. Um, also, it seems like half of all their opioid addicts in Egypt are addicted solely to tramadol. Um, it unfortunately was found in the um, sort of toxicology studies of the rapper Old Dirty Bastard from Wu-Tang Clan. Um, again, probably had some polysubstance overdose because there was some cocaine as well. But, you know, just like this Billy Mays meme, you know, 2020 just gets better every second we live in it. Um, and everything I've talked about to this point has just been about therapeutic doses of tramadol. Like I haven't even touched what happens when you start to overdose on it. So I'm sure everyone remembers this slide from my grand rounds last year and thanks for reviewing it last night. Um, this is a California poison control study looking at um, drug induced seizures and they looked at all patients who had seizures and then what compounds they were. Um, you know, spoiler report from last year, Dupropion was the most commonly one they came across. Um, tramadol is actually, 8% um, of their patients will seize due to tramadol and actually 6% from bamlafaxine. So it actually gives, if you look at kind of the uh, end organ effects, it's actually kind of a, um, a mixed picture, right? You get CNS depression in a quarter of them that were respond in naloxone, and that sounds kind of opioidy. And then on the other end, you get some nausea and vomiting, tachycardia, and seizures at this 13.7% rate, which if you remember from before my slides, that's the same rate of seizures as bemlafaxine. Um, and majority of these will happen in the first six hours, just like bemlafaxine. And they found the minimum dose for having seizures with respect to tramadol was 200 milligrams. And most patients are usually on 50 to 100 milligrams, um, like Q6 to Q8 hours. What they found when they did a big logistic regression in this is that there's an association between seizures and tramadol in males, chronic users, suicide attempts, intentional abuse, and actually it's predictive in patients who um, initially present with tachycardia. Uh, 
Another meta-analysis looking into it, a slightly higher seizure rate and exposures at 17%. Obviously with their subgroups, it's gonna be higher in the overdosers and the abusers, but 3% of normal patients uh, will have um, seizures at uh, normal doses. Again, um, an increased um, association between seizures and gender, and it's sort of an, interestingly a decreased association a more odds ratio less than one in patients who got naloxone uh, prior. Uh, the seizures, they generally occur within the first four to six hours. They're usually a single generalized tonic-clonic seizure. Um, however, some studies have said upwards of half of patients will have multiple seizures. Um, perhaps, uh, I didn't, uh, they didn't really allude into it, but maybe um, some of this could be due to the uh, hypoglycemic effects. Um, and it seems like the seizure rate at therapeutic dosages is about 0.1 to 0.8%. Um, percent. Another thing we always have to worry about is serotonin syndrome. Um, there are case reports of it and it is generally rare. Um, I highlight this thing called the Hunter criteria within here. Um, something good for maybe some of the EMs and juniors to look over to as to, you know, whether or not, you know, when patients ingest a serotonergic agent ever, well, and it kind of helps you uh, go through this algorithm and figure out whether or not they have serotonin syndrome, but it's sort of more of an academic interest thing too. Again, from a dose perspective, when should we start to worry? It seems like 2000 milligrams is when um, they get to into more sort of adverse events like seizures from respiratory depression. So the median dose for seizures is about 2000 milligrams. And then um, only the immediate release um, is here in Canada and that's after one and a half hours. Um, from a respiratory depression, again, same thing around that 2000 milligram dose is when they start to get it. And in this study, they found actually 41% of patients had a decreased level of consciousness. There is um, an increased association of patients um, having seizures if they're on an SSRI or an SNRI, also a TCA, not unsurprisingly, but you know, maybe next time if you're thinking of prescribing this to someone and they're on one of those medications, I'd probably hold back from prescribing it to them. From an observation perspective, um, the immediate release should be for 10 hours and the extended release should be for 24 hours. Um, and also just keep in the back of your mind that there is the Tramacet or sort of Tramadol Tylenol embedded compound. Um, and uh, you should check a Tylenol level as well. And potentially if it's in big massive overdoses, keep checking levels because their GM utility is gonna be off. So, I mean, I think it's time to kind of fully dispel this myth that Tramadol is a benign medication and is not an opioid. Um, an opioid defined by Goldfrank, which is sort of the, you know, in my opinion, the Bible of toxicology, um, says that it's a, uh, any substance that binds an opioid receptor. And as we learned, Tramadol and its metabolite bind opioid receptors. Um, it will cause predictable CNS and respiratory depression and it will respond to naloxone. So tramadol is an opioid. Somewhere in the world, there is this trade name of tramadol called Trump. And I think we've all learned sort of about the horrors of that. So maybe you guys can just think of tramadol um, or the adverse effects of it next time you do prescribe it. This is just sort of a generalized slide, um, you know, highlighting some of the toxicologic principles of uh, venlafaxine. Um, which I went over, and then this one is about tramadol as well. And I'd be more than happy to send these guys out to you, or send these slides out to you um, if needed. And that concludes my grand rounds. Um, I'll take any questions if there are any. Um, John, it's Don Giffen uh -huh. here. I, uh, the great rounds, thank you. I wonder if it's time that we considered taking Tramadol off our quick orders. Yes. Um, since it's, it's really uh, highly discouraged to be used um, by most of the toxicologists. I wonder if Morgan ever prescribes it. I know that David uh, Yearling in Toronto um, has been advocating for years to have it as a regulated um, medication and discourages its use. He describes it as, um, a, as if uh, Prozac and codeine had a baby, and that baby turned into a southern teenager who only wore black and occasionally set fires and kicked puppies. So it seems like a really inadvisable medication to use in general. Yeah, I mean, I would certainly... Uh advocate for that as well. Um, I mean, there's not much evidence that it does really anything, if at all. Um, I think the whole concept of like, you know, it binds an opioid, like it's a weak opioid. Like if you're, why don't you just give them a low dose of morphine or a low dose of hydromorphone? Um, and again, especially with a patient who are on multiple medications, I think it um, has enough adverse events where we should probably like rethink and kind of reclassify it. And I think it's in our, like on 
our EMR, it's in the like mild to moderate analgesia with the sort of Tylenol threes and the Percocets. Um, I've, you know, now since I've looked into it and I've, this has been on my radar for about a year and a bit, um, I haven't prescribed it since then. Um, and for anyone who's interested, this Dave Gerling guy is a clinical pharmacologist and toxicologist out of Toronto. And he has a lot of, um, you know, kind of the same stuff I've highlighted. He has a lot of good stuff on the internet out there. Um, I'm not sure if Morgan's in this channel. I would, I would say we should probably, it's time we should probably think about taking it off. Yeah, I think when we sat down and we made that quick order page, there was some conversation about having a rounds at some point to talk about some of these uh, specifics regarding some of those drugs like Percocets and Tramacet. Uh, and the hope was that eventually I think we would move towards removing it. But at that point, we didn't want to just take it away because some people were so, um, some people are quite big users of it. But thankfully now we've had this round. So hopefully we can move forward with that. Just to add to that, sorry, it's Justin here. Um, just to add that, add to that, I'm, we're seeing a lot of um, ortho patients that are being discharged mm -hmm. from the, the floor uh, post-op on Tramacet as well. So um, it's just something that maybe uh, in terms of your talk, TFE, if it should be disseminated a little bit to the um, orthopedics teams as well. Yeah, and, and GenSurge too. I see a lot of, um, like even when I was on GenSurge, was, oh God, five years ago as an R1, um, it seemed to be like everybody was just going home on it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd be more than happy to um, relay these rounds to them or, you know, we have discussions with, you know, some of them and their nurse practitioners about it too. On that note, I'm curious to know what people are doing if they have a patient who comes in who is on tram at all or um, even Tylenol number three or Percocet, neither of which I prescribe either. Uh, when they come in and for whatever reason they're requiring additional pain control, they've been recently discharged from one of these other services. Are people saying, well, hell no, I don't prescribe that, or are people providing prescriptions for that when they're presenting to the department for whatever reason? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a, you know, that's a whole grand rounds in itself, and those are incredibly complex issues to come across. Um, you know, even if you look at, you know, some of the, some of the stuff I had in that, in my talk about, um, you know, likelihood of patients being on opioids for or tramadol for long periods of time, even having a subsequent dose of it will be, um, you know, increases your likelihood of that happening. So, I mean, I, you know, if it's recently post-op, I usually just get the service themselves to kind of come down and deal with it. Um, but if it's, you know, you know, several weeks out of the, outside of the fact, like I just usually just say, I'm not comfortable giving you anything else. I'm just kind of tunnel and have and go from there. Um, but, you know, very uh, frustrating and often unsatisfying patient encounters that you do have. John, you had an interesting point that's unrelated to your talk, but it was on one of your slides looking at the increased dosing uh, or use of, uh, of different opioids. And uh, you didn't mention it, but the one that's almost exactly the same percentage increase over the last, whatever it was, five or 10 years is a hydro, uh, hydromorphone, which is 22 or 23%, yep. um, um, which worries me uh, a, a fair bit because it's so easily um, you know, ground up, heated up, and, and used as an injectable because it's a, it's a pure, pure drug, um, which then makes me think, you know, we, we talked about maybe not prescribing drugs like Percocet or uh, Tunnel 3s because they're combination drugs, but is there an advantage to using those in that they're not as readily directly turned into, you know, drugs that can be shot up IV? I don't know, I'd be interested in Morgan's comment on that. I personally, if from, I, I'm, I'm not a very big prescriber of opioids, um, but I think when we sat down and we made those, uh, those guidelines, we had morphine in there for that reason, to try to encourage people to try to use more oral morphine, because it just is less, um, not that it's not abusable, but it's definitely not the same as hydromorphone in terms of the euphoric effect. Um, so I think that's, that's the alternative. If, if you truly feel that you need to prescribe an opioid, uh, morphine would be uh, a more ideal choice. It's never made a lot of sense to me that we, we jump straight to hydromorphone when we treat patients um, 
you know, parenterally in the emergency department. Um, and then we send them, it works. So we send them home on hydromorphone. I mean, why would we do yeah, that? I mean, I, I would agree with that too. Um, Nuts. It, it, they're, they're just, that's just a hard, like, like, it's sort of a can of worms you're opening up when you're putting them on, you know, sending them home on large doses of narcotics. Um, like even you see with, you know, like bad ankle fractures and stuff, like ortho will send them home on, you know, like take your regular Tylenol and then they'll just throw like, you know, 30 hydromorphones at them. Um, you know, I, I think it's just a, you know, we know a lot about the adverse effects of it, but there are certain things where they're going to need to be able to, you know, be on it. But I, I, as I said, I think this is like a very interesting topic for, you know, a whole kind of grand rounds in itself too, um, which I kind of anticipated these questions coming up after. I think this whole issue of, uh, you know, seizures with tramadol is fascinating, particularly. Any other questions? Uh, John. Um, thanks very much for the rounds. Um, it reminds me a little bit of the discussion that went on a number of years ago with respect to codeine and the pediatric population with the variability of metabolization and MCultra metabolizers. Mm -hmm. And the hospital um, was able to get codeine sort of taken out of the formulary for the pediatric population. And I was fascinated by your graph showing the variability of metabolization with a CYP2D um, uh, enzyme. Mm -hmm. So I suspect the same thing occurs with adults. It's quite clear that when you prescribe Tramel, you actually don't know what dose you're giving them, even though you know the milligrams of the parent compound you're prescribing. Or what drug they're getting. Yeah, exactly. How much, yeah. Um, and Justin's exactly right that the, certainly at the hospital level, the biggest advocates and users have been the surgical services. In fact, their uh, discharge power plans, uh, including their outpatient power plans for things like arthroscopy and stuff like that, have all moved over the last sort of eight years to favor tramadol. And their view is that, oh, well, we're not giving them a narcotic. So, I think we, we'd like to take you up on your offer of doing this rounds for the for the surgical side of the house. Yeah, I I, I believe Ian Ball did a talk on tramadol a couple of years ago um, to the surgeons, but I'd be you know I like I remember getting that email. I should probably touch base with him about it. Um, but I'd be yeah certainly more than happy to do this talk for them as well. Um, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, I'm curious to know what it might look like now as well versus a few years ago because in several states uh, tramadol is a controlled substance mm -hmm. though not universally across the U.S. so the fact that it's not a controlled substance here you know certainly makes it I think easier for people to justify prescribing it but I wonder with this sort of well, change. Not, not yet it's it's going to within I think when they oh, yes. they're updating it in the next year and that's going to be a controlled substance at that point in time. Yeah, so hopefully that will be a bit of a sea change, uh, especially as it's, you know, already taken hold in many of the American states. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting, um, like, if you look at uh, Newfoundland, for example, they need to have a separate license or a separate, as well as a separate prescription pad for opioids versus prescribing other medications. So the, the, op the, the tramadol use there is, is a lot higher, if, if not just for the, the barrier of like, you have to print off a different prescription. So people tend to, to give tramadol, I think in, in a lot higher amounts there. I think that probably also explains um, some of that, that use in Egypt where, you know, a, a lot of medications, like essentially every medications other than, than um, again, quote unquote opioids are available over the counter. Um, so the, the availability of tramadol compared to the availability of things like hydromorph um, would probably explain some of the, the use patterns there. Also, everyone in Egypt drives like they're on tramadol, not just those that are. <laughs> All right, any other questions, comments, concerns? Thanks, John. All right, thank you.